Today, I'd like to talk about something which many of you may misunderstand. You may misunderstand this thing quite a bit. For this reason, please gather your mental energies and set your mind upon the task of listening carefully. Please pay very careful attention to what will be said today. The subject that we'll be talking about is sukha or happiness. This is a word that is quite ambiguous both in the Thai language, suk, the Pali language, sukha, and the English language, happiness. In all three languages, this word has quite varied meanings and applications. Sometimes it can be difficult to, quite, to understand quite what somebody means when they're speaking about happiness. So we will be speaking about sukha or happiness today. The happiness in the everyday lives of ordinary people is one kind of happiness. And then the happiness that arises with the realization of the final goal of life, that is another kind of happiness. There are these two quite different things, but we both describe, we describe both of them as happiness or sukha. And generally, we mix these two meanings up, confuse them, and never quite understand what we're talking about. Let's take a look at these different meanings of the word sukha. Here's one way that the ambiguity, ambiguity of the word happiness can cause problems. Many of you have come to practice and study Dhamma in search of happiness. Now the thing is, your understanding of happiness, the happiness that you desire, is this the same kind of happiness that is the genuine goal of Dhamma and of the practice of Dhamma? If, what, if the happiness that you desire is not the happiness which Dhamma practice leads to, then we're, we're worried that you will be disappointed, and that your hopes will turn out sour. So let's look, at, let's look at the meanings of happiness. Let's not confuse the two different kinds of happiness. And most of all, let's understand the genuine goal, the true happiness, which is the aim of Dhamma practice. In order to save time and make it easy for you to listen and understand, Let's set down a very simple, short principle for the understanding of happiness. The ordinary happiness that most people are talking about is when there is hunger or a need or a want, and then that hunger or need or want is satisfied. This is the common understanding of happiness. But happiness in the Dhamma sense is when there is no hunger, no need, no want, when we are free of hunger, need, and want. This is happiness in the Dhamma sense. So let's be very clear about this. Please pay very careful attention to the distinction make sure that you understand. The common ordinary happiness is when hunger is satisfied. The satisfaction of hunger is common happiness. When there is no ha hunger at all, 
when there is no need of hunger. That is the happiness of Dhamma. Hunger satisfied is the first kind. No hunger at all is the Dhamma kind of happiness. You can probably see that the first kind of happiness, that of the satisfaction of hunger, is a very worldly kind of happiness. It depends on the world, it is caught up in the world, and it is within the limitations and conditions of the world. But the Dhamma happiness, where there is no hunger at all, this is above the world. This is a transcendent kind of happiness. It goes beyond the world. This is an opportunity to, to introduce you to two, two words, lokiya and lokutara, because it follows from what was just said. Lokiya means going or some <clears throat> means according to worldly matters, worldly concerns. Lokiya is to be in the world, caught up in the world, and under the power and influence of the world. So we can, in short, say worldly or mundane is a common translation. The second word, word is logutara. It is to be above the world, to transcend the world, to be out from under the power and influence of the world, but to be above that power and influence. This is often translated supramundane or transcendent. So then we can see that there are two kinds of happiness, logia sukha, worldly happiness, and logutara sukha, transcendent or supramundane happiness. See the distinction between these two and be very clear about them. Let's look at these even a bit closer. Let's go a little bit deeper into these meanings. Lokiya means to be stuck in the world, to be caught up and trapped in the world so that the power and influence of the world dominates. Logutara is to be released, oh, excuse me, and this logia, this being stuck in the world, is to be not free. This is a lack, the absence of spiritual freedom, of spiritual independence. Logutara is to be released from the world, to get unstuck, to be above its power and influence. Logutara, or this transcendent state, is spiritual freedom. So these two kinds of happiness, the worldly and the transcendent, the first kind is a happiness that is not free. It is a kind of slavery, this sort of happiness. Whereas transcendent happiness is happiness that is free and independent because it is above the world. So there is the, free, the happiness of slavery and the happiness of freedom. So now I think you can see the importance of this point. If what you're after if what you desire is worldly happiness, logia asuka, and you come here and study the Dhamma, you're going to be disappointed. This transcendent happiness is the opposite of worldly happiness. And so what the Dhamma, what correct meditation is about, is transcendent happiness. So we want you to understand this clearly because we're afraid if you're here in search of worldly happiness that you'll be disappointed, that you won't, you won't get what you're after. So please understand these two kinds of happiness and then you'll understand 
what Sue and Monk is about. Please investigate the difference between these two kinds of happiness and understand where you're coming from. See the worldly happiness that is based in hunger and then the transcendent happiness that when there is no hunger at all. Investigate this matter and see in what ways, in to what degree these two kinds of happiness differ from each other. So let's summarize this as clear as possible. Two kinds of happiness. One, the happiness from getting according to one's hunger, from receiving according to one's hunger. Happiness number two, no hunger at all, freedom from hunger. Two kinds of sukha, very clear. He wants me to do that even shorter. Let's see. I'll try. The first one is hunger satisfied. Hunger satisfied and no hunger. So the two kinds of happiness. Now the first one, the happiness based on the satisfaction of hunger. The problem with this is that hunger can never be fully satisfied. Things are always changing, and so whatever satisfies the hunger changes, and there's hunger again, or the hunger itself changes. And so hunger is in fact a sort of eternal situation. It can never be satisfied. But the world today, if we look around in modern society, this is the only kind of happiness anyone is interested in, is the happiness that they get from satisfying their desires. Imagine if we were the, imagine if you, just you, were the owner of the world, of the universe, of the entire cosmos, you, you own everything. Now that you're the owner of everything, does hunger stop? Can it stop? So take a look in your own minds and hearts. Take a very close look and see. If you were to get everything that you could possibly desire, to the point where you owned everything in the universe, would your hunger cease? Would the hunger stop? Or once you owned the entire universe, would you hunger for a second universe? Would you desire a third universe? Look in your own hearts and minds and see if it's this way or not. If we look, we'll see that hunger is a thing that never ends. It's endless. But the world today is concentrating its time, effort, and energy towards building and producing things which are lovely and satisfying. The economies of the world are designed solely to satisfy hungers. And so we've dug ourselves a very deep, deep hole in this orientation of our lives where we are only concerned with satisfying hunger. So take a look inside and see where happiness really is. Is the present way of things going to really bring happiness? The happiness of the world, or the happiness of human beings, proceeds by levels. There are steps and stages to human happiness. 
the infant, the young infant, is completely happy when it is cuddled in its mother's arms and can suck milk from her breast. This is the happiness of an infant. In this situation, the infant is completely happy. But then as soon as it grows a little further, gets a little bigger, this no longer satisfies it. The mother's breast isn't enough. Now it's learning about all kinds of other foods. And so its happiness is based on these other kinds of food, sweets, hamburgers, junk food, Rice Krispies, whatever. And also in being able to run around the house and the yard. It's no longer satisfied in its mother's arms. It needs to be able to run around in the house. This is a young child. And then it grows a little older. And it wants to, the child will go play football or with dolls or something. And so, another kind of happiness. But it, the child outgrows this kind of happiness also and becomes a teenager. And as a teenager, the happiness, the ideas of happiness start to turn to sex. Grow up and become young men and women and all they do is think about sex, dates, and this kind of happiness. And finally, the human being marries with a wife or a husband. Then the thoughts of happiness are all about the house, clothes, the job, things like this. And this situation continues where the happiness progresses from one stage to another beginning with the happiness of an infant, where the infant, infant is completely satisfied with the comfort and security of his, its mother's arms and drinking the milk. Through progressive levels to where the hunger and the happiness is bigger and bigger, or where the hunger is bigger and bigger and more difficult to satisfy to the point where the human being dies and is reborn as a deva or a, a heavenly being. And still, even though reborn in a heavenly realm, still hungry through thousands of years. <laughs> hunger, the hunger is never satisfied even in heaven. Or if we take it from a Christian point of view, even if one goes to heaven, is in the kingdom of God, then hunger is still not satisfied. This is the way it is with worldly happiness that is based on the satisfaction of hunger. It's endless. It never stops. It just keeps growing and growing and growing from very simple levels to more and more complex levels. The kingdom of God, we're not sure what individual Christians exactly believe about when they think of the kingdom of God. We're not quite sure what the theologians think either. If the kingdom of God is a place where there is still successive levels of hunger, of seeking after the happiness that is based in the satisfaction of hunger and desire. This is what the kingdom of God is about, then Buddhism isn't very interested. But if the kingdom of God is the end of hunger, freedom from hunger, the absence of hunger, then that's the same as Nibbana, the goal of Buddhist practice. So we're not sure what the Christians are after. Now in the Buddhist description of the universe, there are many, many levels 
to the world or to the universe. There's the common human world which we, with which we are familiar. In this world, we are, we, <clears throat> we go about trying to satisfy the hungers of the human condition. And above this are various heavenly realms. And there is, for instance, the realm of the devas, one level of heavenly being. And they, they live in a realm called the Gamawachan or, or Gamawachara, which is the sensuous heaven. And so these devas still have sensual hunger and their happiness is based on the satisfaction of these sensual hungers. They don't have the problems in satisfying these hungers that humans have, but they still have the hunger. But then there are realms above that. There are finer and more subtle levels of hunger. And so there are the Brahma worlds. There are two main Brahma worlds. One is where there is no longer sensual hunger, but there is still a hunger for forms, for material existence, for material things. But it's not as crude as the sensual hunger. And then above that is the Brahma world of non-material or formless existence where the hunger is for purely formless, purely immaterial things. But even here, on the highest, most sublime heaven, there is still hunger. Hunger doesn't end. It just climbs up this ladder from one level to the next, higher and higher. But it is endless. There's no stopping it at least in this way. So this is what the world is about, all these different levels of hunger. And worldly happiness is all caught up in these different levels of hunger. So whether it's a Christian cosmology or a Buddhist cosmology, as long as the hunger, or as long as happiness is based on the satisfaction of hunger, there's no end to it. So that's why we, we take a look at transcendent happiness, where there is no hunger. Hunger is stopped. We end hunger. We let go of hunger. This is, this is true happiness. Now this kind of happiness, when there is no hunger, when there is freedom from desire, is when the I, the me, the self, the myself no longer exist, when these illusions, when these deceptive false concepts no longer arise in the mind. So we need to see the connection between the end of hunger and the cessation of these, the cessation of the illusion of self the illusion of I and me and mine. Because in the worldly situations, there's always a self or an I who hungers and who is trying to satisfy the hunger. And even when this self works its way up to the highest Brahma realm, where the hunger is only for immaterial things, there's still a self trying to get what it, trying to get things, trying to be things. And as long as there is a self or an I, hunger persists and it will not be satisfied. That's why we need to look at the other side of the, the situation where there is no hunger because there is freedom from, from self, freedom from I, me, mine. At this point, 
you ought to be familiar with what we call good, the thing that we call good, and also the thing we call the best. You have to have an idea what these are about. Now, whatever you identify as the best, that is where your hunger stops. Your hunger will always be reaching for the best. Now, if you identify hunger with a day on the beach, or, I mean, if you identify the best with a day on the beach, then that's where your hunger proceeds. Or if you identify the best with five minutes of no nasty thoughts going through your head. Well, that's where your hunger will stop. Or if you identify the best with going to heaven and basking in God's radiance, well, that is where you will, your hunger will stop. But by stop, maybe I should use another word, I don't mean that it ends. <laughs> That's just, when you identify something as the best, that's what you hunger for. But once you get there, does it really stop? Once you spend your day on the beach, or your five minutes of calm meditation, or your, your whatever in the kingdom of God, does hunger stop? As long as there is a self, that is identifying something as the best. Whether it is the best of children, which is one level, the best of teenagers, young adults, married people, old people, the best of heavenly beings on the successive levels. As long as there is a self that is identifying something as the best and hungering for it, then that hunger is endless. There is no real stopping. Hunger will fix on that thing which is identified as the sunambanam, the supreme goodness. But if it gets there, then it'll just start hungering for something more because there is still clinging to a self, to I, me, and mine. So this is what worldly happiness is like. No matter on what level it is, whether on a crude, easy to satisfy level of animals, or on deeper, more subtle, loftier levels of celestial beings, whatever kind of happiness it is, it is still based on the satisfaction of the hunger of some self or some I, then there is no end to it. It will just keep growing or developing or evolving on, into these higher and higher levels. This is what Logia Sukha, worldly happiness, is all about, hunger and its satisfaction. But as soon as there is a little satisfaction, there is immediately more hunger. There is never total satisfaction. This just illustrates that if we're going to ever be happy, <laughs> we're going to have to look for happiness somewhere else. If we keep looking for it in the world, we're just going to have this endless process of hunger throughout this life and who knows, maybe on into other lives as well. So this is why we need to be interested in Loguttara Sukha. Transcendent happiness, where there is no I, no self, no me, no mine, no myself to hunger, to be hungered for. There's freedom from hunger, and there's freedom from this egoistic identification with things. 
this freedom from the world, this transcendence of the world, is where true happiness lies. So, try and understand what worldly happiness is about. And begin to get interested in transcendent happiness. If you can do that, you have a chance of success. Now this, this thing called the best, which we each identify and attach to in our own way, it doesn't come alone. If there is the best, there is also the worst. When there is good, there is evil or bad. So when we're still looking at things in terms of good and the best, this drags with it the worst and the bad. For this reason, there's no freedom. This hungering after the best keeps us entangled with the worst. Always wanting good things keeps us cluttered up with bad things. This is because the own, because of the illusions and limitations of our own understanding. And that's why chasing after the best is just a self-perpetuating hunger. The way out of this hunger is voidness, emptiness, the freedom from I, from self, from me and mine. Those of you who are Christians or have been Christians or raised in Christian families and who have read the Bible, especially the first chapter of Genesis, will be familiar with the story of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you understand the meaning of this, then you will understand exactly what Buddhism is about. Even though traditional Christians may interpret it this in a different way. God for hello. God forbid Adam to eat of the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, if you eat this... Okay, back to the, the Bible. God told Adam that if he ate from the fruit of this tree, that he would die. Now, the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is to start distinguishing things as good and as evil. It's the beginning of dualistic thought. And once one gets trapped in this, there is death. There is death because there is a self. All dualistic thought comes out of the illusion of a self, the separation of a self from the rest of nature. So with this original dualism, grows into the dualism of good and evil, and from that follows death. Before eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there was no death, because there was none of this knowledge of good and evil, none of this dualistic thought. There was no self, no I, no me, no mine. Now, Adam's children, down through us, carry with us this death and this burden of self, the burden of knowing good and knowing evil. And so we attach to the best, we attach to the worst, we identify things as good and attach to them, we identify things as bad and we suppress them. So we're caught up in the worldly condition through this attachment to self and attachment through dualistic thought. And this leads to death, as God taught Adam in the Bible. 
Now what are we to do about it, those of us who have inherited this problem? To keep running around chasing after the satisfaction of our hunger, to keep seeking the best, is just to perpetuate this cycle of birth and death. It's just to keep the hunger going. And it will never satisfy anything. That is why Buddhism is not interested in any of these realms of higher and more subtle happiness that is based on satisfaction of hunger. Because there's no end to these things. There's no true peace or happiness. So, if we talk about God as some big ego or big self, or we talk about God as the supreme good, Buddhists cannot accept this. To say that the highest thing, the supreme thing in the universe is the highest good or is the collection of everything good or the totality of good or the perfection of good. Buddhists cannot accept this because this is still based in egoistic, dualistic thought. Therefore, it is based in attachment and is deluded thinking. But, if the highest thing, God, if we choose to use that word, the highest thing is beyond good, then Buddhists can accept it. In Buddhism, the highest thing is emptiness, voidness. The voidness of the I, of the self, of the delusions of me and mine, of the false conceptions of myself. This is the highest thing. Voidness is beyond good and beyond evil. It is beyond the, the best. And thus, emptiness is freedom from the spinning around, the going round and round in circles, chasing after things that will satisfy hunger. In emptiness, both the hunger and the one who hungers disappear. There is no self to hunger. There is no one, no thing, no anything that is hungry, not even God. And so hunger disappears too. In emptiness, all these illusions of me and mine disappear. Hunger disappears because there is no one or nothing, no self, no I, no me, no mine, to hunger. This is the highest thing. This is what the goal of the practice of Dhamma is about. It is tr to transcend the endless cycles of hunger in worldly existence and to be free of hunger, free of self free of the one who hungers. This is emptiness or voidness. It's the highest thing. So the knowledge of good and evil is a central concept in both Buddhism and Christianity. Back before there was knowledge of good and evil, it was impossible or it, when there is no knowledge of good and evil, it is impossible to attach to good and evil. When there is no attachment to them, then there is no dukkha. There are no problems. But what happens after the fruit of the, knowledge of, the, fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil has been eaten? What happens after we know good and evil? We know good and evil, but we lack the wisdom to stay in control of the situation. 
And so we go and attach to good or we attach to evil as they arise in the way of ordinary human beings. So we just go around attaching to good things and attaching to bad things. This is what happens after eating that fruit. This attachment brings with it dukkha. It brings with it all the problems of life and it brings with it death. These are the results of eating that fruit, dukkha and death. But for those of us who have knowledge of good and evil, there's no going back to that point where we don't know good and we don't know evil. But what, what can be done, what must be done, what is our duty and responsibility is to learn that this good and this evil that we have knowledge of, that they should not be attached to, that they must not be attached to. Don't attach. Learn how to not attach. Learn to not attach. Stop attaching to good and evil. And so though the knowledge of good and evil will remain, attachment to them will cease. And when attachment to them ceases, <clears throat> then there will be no dukkha and no death, just as it was with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden before they ate that fruit. For us, there's no going back to a state of innocence, but there still is the need and the necessity of going beyond attachment and being free of dukkha and death. This is the essence or the heart of both Christianity and Buddhism, even though some Buddhists and some Christians will understand things in quite a different way. But if you understand this, then you will have the key to genuine happiness, to freedom, and to the end of hunger. When we know the good, we hunger for the good. When we know the better, then we hunger for what is better. And when we know what the best is, then we hunger for the best. And then we find something that is even more the best, even better than the best, and hunger for that. We hunger for the best best. We're always caught up in this hunger. And no matter how subtle, how fine, or how invisible this hunger is, it will still give rise to problems and dukkha. Coarse, low-level hunger will give rise to coarse, crude dukkha. The more subtle the hunger, the more subtle the dukkha. And so when the hunger is on these very subtle, very refined, possibly invisible levels, then the dukkha will also be very subtle and refined and invisible. Nonetheless, there is dukkha. Our lives will be troubled. And there will not be perfect peace or perfect happiness. So this is why Buddhism teaches emptiness which transcends the best. In, happy, in emptiness, there is complete freedom from any hunger. There is no crude hunger and there is no subtle and fine hunger. Even the highest, most subtle and invisible levels of hunger are gone. 
and therefore there is no dukkha whatsoever, there are no problems, and there is peace. As long as there is some hunger remaining, no matter how subtle it is, then the final goal has not been reached. But when all hunger has been extinguished, and with it all dukkha and all problems, that is the final goal. This is emancipation in Buddhism. Emancipation is this freedom from hunger. Emancipation is emptiness, emptiness of self, the voidness of I, me, mine. This is the final goal, this final emancipation, liberation, and freedom. Let's take another look at this word hunger. We can see two kinds or two levels of hunger. Physical hunger and mental or spiritual hunger. Physical hunger has to do with the needs of the body for food, clothing, shelter, and medicine. This kind of hunger is not a problem. It can be satisfied and does not have to lead to dukkha. Physical hunger need not lead to dukkha. We can see this in the animals who have these physical needs and hungers as well these instinctual needs for food, clothing, shelter, and medicine. But they do not experience dukkha because of that. The problem with human beings is that our minds have developed beyond the minds of mere animals. In animals, the minds are still on a relatively low level where they do not make physical hunger into spiritual hunger. They do not attach to their physical hunger and cause it to be a spiritual hunger which leads to dukkha. But in human beings, the mind has evolved onto a much higher level. And on this level, there is lots of attachment. This highly evolved mind of the human being gets caught up in dualistic thought and attaches to things. It clings to things. And this is what gives rise to spiritual hunger and dukkha. So if we can see these two kinds of hunger, the physical and the spiritual, and distinguish between them, then when there is a physical need, it can be recognized. When it is recognized, it can be dealt with in a wise, mindful way so that no problems ar arise. If this physical hunger is recognized as it is and is dealt with wisely, that means there will be no attachment to it as my hunger, as my problem, or as I or me. So physical hunger remains just physical hunger and is not a problem, nor is it dukkha. So if we can stop attaching to these physical needs and physical hunger, then it is possible for spiritual hunger to stop. See that this spiritual hunger is where the real problem is, this attachment to good and bad, to this and that to me and you. See that this spiritual hunger, this attachment, is the cause of all our problems and the cause of dukkha. So understand the difference between these two levels or these two kinds of hunger, the physical and the spiritual. The physical which we share with animals and the spiritual hunger which is uniquely human. So there are these two kinds of hunger. The hunger on the physical level need not be any sort of problem. When any of these kind of hungers arise, such as a need to eat, then just go and eat. 
take care of the situation wisely and with mindfulness, and then there will be no problems, no attachment and no spiritual hunger will arise. Physical hungers, physical needs can be taken care of in this way. It's quite simple and it need not cause any problems or difficulties. Truly, physical hunger should not disturb us in any way. It should just be taken care of wisely and mindfully. That's all. It's very simple. Now with spiritual hunger, the more we eat, the more we're hungry. When there is spiritual hunger, whatever it's hungering for, if we give it a little bit, the hunger just grows and wants more. And so the more we try and satisfy spiritual hunger, the more it expands, the more it grows. This is because it's an endless, unsatisfiable kind of hunger. Now most of you came here with some kind of hope or wish or expectation. And these hopes, wishes and expectations are in themselves kinds of spiritual hunger. So be careful about these hopes and wishes and expectations. A problem in the world is that most children are taught, are trained to have hopes, wishes and expectations. This is encouraged and much of our modern education is based on these hopes and expectations. It gives rise to competition, all kinds of tests, psychological tests and all sorts of things. But these hopes and expectations can never be satisfied because they're just another kind of spiritual hunger. And so when we go and teach our children encourage them to hunger in spiritual ways, what good are we doing them or anyone else? The phys we should just teach children to learn how to satisfy physical hunger in mindful and wise ways. And rather than teach them to develop spiritual hunger, teach them to not attach to it, to let go of spiritual hunger. And when there is no spiritual hunger, when there is no physical hunger, physical hunger is dealt with wisely and mindfully, and there is no attachment which gives rise to spiritual hunger. In the absence of both kinds of hunger, can you imagine what that kind of bliss, what that peacefulness and joy would be like? Can you picture it? The total absence of all hunger. Think about it. So finally, we'd like to say a few things about what it's like, about the results, the fruit of the total absence of hunger. So now we'll say something about the fruit, the results of the end of hunger. To explain this, we'd like to introduce one more word. We'll use a Pali word, and please try and remember it, even though we realize this, these are new words and it's a new language. This new word is we wake up, we wake up, we wake up. In Thai, it's we wake, we wake. In Pali, we wake up. This word means utmost aloneness, utter solitude, to be alone. There are three levels to we wake up. There's the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. Physical we wake up is when nothing disturbs one on the physical level. There are no physical disturbances. Then one is alone physically. One is in physical solitude. 
But even if there is physical we wake up, there may not be much happiness. There are many people who turn into hardcore meditators and go running off to caves or forests or soundproof rooms or isolation chambers seeking physical aloneness because they think they will find happiness there. But if there is just physical solitude but not mental solitude, they will not find much happiness. Mental solitude is when no fears, no emotions, no loves, hates, frustrations, jealousies, envies, and worries disturb the mind. When these things do not disturb the mind, then there is mental we wake up. There can be mental we wake up even in a crowded room when we are with many other people. It is not dependent on physical we wake up. Now when there is physical we wake up and mental we wake up, this is still not the highest happiness. This is not the goal of meditation. This is not the goal of Buddhism. Just to have physical and mental solitude or to be alone physically and mentally. That's not the end. It's not the final goal. Thus there is the third and highest level of Viveka. This Viveka is when there is the spirit is not disturbed by I, by me, by mine. When there is no attachment to self, myself, or things that belong to me. No me and mine. This kind of aloneness, this kind of solitude is spiritual we wake up. And this spiritual we wake up is emancipation, is liberation, is freedom in Buddhism. This is the final goal, is spiritual solitude. The goal is not to be off alone in some cave or just to have a peaceful, quiet mind. The goal is to be completely free of the disturbances of the self, of false illusions about I and me and mine. To get, be completely rid of all of these deceptions, all of this attachment. This is the ultimate freedom for which we practice the Dhamma. So understand these three levels of Viveka. When you can have physical Viveka, well then make use of it. Learn to develop mental Viveka. But most of all, keep practicing until there is spiritual Viveka. This is what we mean by happiness, the spiritual we wake up, where no ideas of self, of me and mine, disturb the spirit. This is ultimate peace. This is liberation. This is Nibbana. This is the ultimate happiness, the happiness where there is no hunger. If you are able to practice mindfulness of breathing, anapanasati pavana, completely and successfully through all its steps and stages, then you will come to know these three kinds of viveka. You will know physical viveka, where nothing disturbs one physically, mental viveka, well, there are no mental disturbances. And finally, spiritual we wake up, where no delusions of self disturb the spirit. Through the practice of anapanasati, 
if it is fully developed and, com and fully practiced, these three kinds of viveka will be known. It is not necessary to bring in other methods or practices. Anapanasati by itself, at least according to the Buddha and Ajahn Buddha Dasa, is sufficient to experience and realize these three kinds of aloneness, these three kinds of solitude. And for this reason, we encourage you to fully develop and correctly understand and practice Anapanasati in order to understand this kind of happiness that results when the three kinds of solitude of aloneness are experienced. We want to make this kind of happiness very clear to you because we were afraid that some people might be here looking for something that we cannot provide. Buddhism is interested in the happiness that results from no hunger. If you are interested in the happiness that results when desires are responded to, to when your hungers are satisfied, then there's nothing we can do to help you. If this is what happiness is for you, then Buddhism cannot help you in any way. Buddhism is not about this kind of happiness. But if you are interested in the happiness that results when there is no hunger, when there is physical aloneness, mental aloneness, and spiritual aloneness, meaning that nothing disturbs the physical, nothing disturbs the mental, and nothing disturbs the spiritual. If you are interested in this kind of happiness, then Buddhism has much to offer you and we will do whatever we can to aid you in your development of this true happiness. In order to know and realize this genuine happiness, we encourage you to come to understand anapanasati and practice it properly and correctly. Avoid attaching to any wrong ideas or any right ideas, but practice anapanasati in a balanced, proper way. If you do that, if you continue practicing it and fully develop it, it will lead to these three kinds of we wake up. It will lead to the true kind of happiness which is not dependent on worldly satisfaction of hunger. This is what Buddhism is about. This is what Anapanasati is for, for transcendent happiness, the freedom of hunger, freedom from hunger, where there is no hunger at all. At this point, we will close today's talk. Thank you all for coming and for making use of Su and Mok. Thank you very much. <laughs>